Welcome back to the College Tailgaters. My name is Chris America. I'm coming to you from the sunshiny state, warm sunshine in Florida. And my co-host, is it chilly there, bud? Oh, it's Sean freezing. Tailgater, what's up, man? It's That's freezing? Right. Oh, it's absolutely freezing cold. Uh, we had the first snow last week. Uh, put the Christmas lights up. Yeah, it's, uh, it's full-on winter here in the wait, Midwest. Wait, wait, wait. Christmas lights before Thanksgiving? What kind of blasphemous is this? I know, I know. I'm not a fan of it either. We haven't uh, plugged them in and turned them on yet, but they're up. I don't need to be up there when it's like two feet of snow. That's so true. So they're up. That's true. They're just not lit. All right, I, I'm, I can not, I'm not that crazy. That. Get it out of the way too. That's right. And then I guess that way on Thanksgiving night you can turn them on. That's pretty cool. Yeah, we'll be the first ones, hopefully. But yeah, like All you right, said, so... I'm Sean Daly. You can find me on Twitter at Tailgater Sean. You can and... find me at Chris Scout Team. You can find our our podcast at Tailgaters Pod. This is all, of course, on Twitter. You can find us. You can listen to us on iTunes, Podbean, ScoutTeamRadio.com, 12OunceSportsRadio.com. Um, guess what, bud? What's that? Uh, Kyle Scout Team's put us on YouTube now. We're YouTube famous. Oh my God! You can find us everywhere. It sounds like MySpace, we're, LinkedIn, Monster.com, anywhere, anywhere you can find. And a podcast, we're there. So you really got Any, no excuse these days. Honestly, anywhere we are, we can put our content up for free. We're up, we're on it, dude. Yeah, I hear you. And anyone out there listening, please rate us, review us on iTunes. That helps us out. Leave something funny. Maybe we'll read it. Yeah, I mean, even if you don't think we're good, at least know that we're nice guys and we deserve a nice rating. Yeah. But I'd say we've been doing a better job than Jim Mora has been doing this year at UCLA. That guy got canned today. He did. So uh, that that school, that, that program right now, uh, there's really no excuse. Like UCLA should not be mediocre to, you know, cellar dweller in the Pac-12. Um, it's a real shame. They got one of the top quarterbacks in the country right now in Rosen, but he's so hard to evaluate because there's no talent around him. The team doesn't play, you know, for anything. They go out there, they look lethargic every week. I don't know. Like, who do you think – wants to take that job now is that a desirable job when there's other openings like tennessee and florida going on well if you're looking at if you're looking at twitter right now chip kelly's taking that job it's already oh, yeah. a done deal yeah well if twitter says so then it's true um then it must but be yeah chip, chip kelly is actually coaching at like 15 different schools next year i don't know if yeah. you know this uh, before seen, we yeah. get too far on a chip kelly down that rabbit hole does does he deserve to get fired does Jim Moore uh, deserve Jim Moore? to get fired? Does yeah. Chip Kelly deserve to get fired from ESPN? <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. Does Jim Moore deserve to be fired from UCLA? I think so. Um, I don't know how long he's been there off the top of my head, um, but he's he's been there a little while now, and uh, that should be a team you know, competing at high-level bowl games, not fighting to get into the Kraft Fight Hunger Bowl. So um, I think a program that, like that has higher expectations. Is that sort and, of – are misled expectations because they play in a big stadium and they play in a big city like LA because I'm looking at their previous records over the last 90 years right now they're really honestly since 1985 that's as far back as I'm going to go right now they have some 10 win seasons scattered in there but it's a lot of 7 and 5 7 and 6 6 and 7 6 and 6 they're not really a consistent a program that wins year in and year out. Uh, their last, just to go over their last few bowl games that weren't with Jim Mora, uh, you got the Fight Hunger Bowl, the Eagle Bank Bowl, the Las Vegas Bowl, the Emerald Bowl, the Sun Bowl, the Las Vegas Bowl, the Silicon Bowl. You see where I'm going with this? Like, their last Rose Bowl appearance um, was 1998, back when Bob Toledo was their coach. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's a little surprising to hear, but sometimes with programs like this, perception is reality. And if people think that it's a big-time program, like you said, because they play in L.A., they play in a big stadium, um, sometimes perception is reality. And we, since we think they're such a good program, you know, they're kind of held to that standard. So yeah, I, I still I think mean, it's look, it, a kind of high-profile job, but I, I wouldn't – you know, I think Tennessee would be more desirable, honestly, than the UCLA job. Ooh, I don't know, man. I, I can't speak of that because as a Gator fan, I, I'm just auto-tuned to just badmouth Tennessee anytime I get. But, I mean, Jim Mora, he won 
nine to ten games his first three seasons. Then it's where he's kind of skidded off with an eight and five, a four and eight, and this year they're five and six. So I guess with the last three years, you got to say, look, you kind of hit your ceiling, and and it's not much. So I guess I can't hate him for moving on. He was there for six years, so. Yeah, and by then you have a pretty good grasp of what's going on. It's not like he was only there for two or three years. He's had a few recruiting classes come through. Um, I think it's time, you know, move on. It's you got to hit the reset button, and I'm a big fan of these midseason uh, coaching changes. You got to get ahead of the curve here. If you wait till the end of the year to fire your coach, and you have a lame duck coach that everyone knows is getting fired, you know, you got to go out right now and get your guy before someone else does. If you, if your guy's Chip Kelly, you need to make moves right now, and I think that's what Florida's doing. You mean UCLA? No, I mean no. Florida. I, I oh, think okay, Florida yeah. has identified their guy, and they're going after him. Um, and it would be in this sort of situation to block a school like UCLA or someone else for going after him first. You got to get done midseason as quickly as you can. Well, right now it is 8:53 Eastern Standard Time, and Twitter it has like over the last two hours, hour to two hours, has blown up that this deal is done between Chip Kelly and Florida. I have not seen anything. Um, from Florida yet, but everybody is saying on Twitter with blue checks and podcasts and newspapers that this is a done deal. Yeah, we've uh, we've been talking about this quite a bit, the Chip Kelly to Florida. I, uh, I've been tracking these flights. There's that one that went to uh, Connecticut uh, a couple days ago, leaving Gainesville. So um, that, that boded pretty well. I know you're a big fan of uh, Chip Kelly to Florida, so... I hope it happens for you. I think he'd be a good fit there. You guys definitely need offense, and you're not going to struggle for that with him. No, not at all. And he's also the guy that is good at the offense. Like Urban Meyer, he's a great coach, right? He's a guy that is able to identify staff and identify players and get them on. But Urban Meyer is not the guy that, if, if I my memory serves me correctly, I don't think he was ever an offensive coordinator anywhere. Um, he was a lot of like wide receiver coach, quarterback coach, and then he just jumped up to head coach at Bowling Green. And obviously he's a phenomenal coach. What I like about Chip Kelly is he's sort of that innovator. He was an offensive coordinator at Oregon before he became a head coach. A lot of people contribute him to the spread offense being what it is today, the kind of the, the godfather of it all type deal. Now, I don't know how true that is. A lot of people say Rich Rodriguez kind of helped develop that, but – um, he's very much an X and O's guy, and I can't think of a better place for his system than in the state of Florida, in the southeast, where there's nothing but speed down here. Yeah, the, that offense he ran in Oregon was prolific with a bunch of three-star recruits from the northwest. And when he can start landing some five-star kids down in Florida, and I don't want to get ahead of myself saying he's already got this job, but if he does get the job, and he can start landing some five stars down there, it, it could change the whole landscape of the SEC. Yeah, I'm definitely excited. Um, I was tweeting out earlier this week, too, that Nick Saban's biggest weakness in his defense, same with Kirby Smart, because obviously those guys go hand-in-hand, hand, being at Alabama for so long together, is the spread offense and an elite offense. Um, I think Nick Saban and Kirby Smart and every single SEC defense, while they are elite, while they do put a lot of players – in the NFL, it's kind of like the Pac-12 offenses or the Big 12 offenses. They say, oh, they're, the Big 12 offenses look really good because they don't play any defense. Well, kind of something that nobody says, but as an SEC observer like myself, the SEC defenses are so good kind of because there's no offense in the SEC. There's not many quarterbacks that come out. I think the last quarterback that came out that was uh, number one overall in the draft was who? Cam Newton? Um, yeah, yeah he'd be the last number one overall. And then you got Johnny Manziel. He was a first round draft pick, but really that's it. Like there's not, we're not sending a plethora amount of quarterbacks into the NFL. So you kind of, you kind of take advantage of that. Yeah, I think, I think that's true. A Chip Kelly doesn't even necessarily need uh, a top tier quarterback. He did have, you know, Mariota out there in Oregon, but I mean, the system he runs, you can almost plug and play. I mean, he was competing with teams like Alabama with, you know, recruits who shouldn't have even been on the same field as some of the guys who are at Alabama. And they were not only competitive, but they were winning games against those top-level teams. So to see what he could do with top-flight talent would be really exciting. Um, before yeah, so we fully they, get off of UCLA, though, 
Um, we brought up that craft fight Hunger Bowl. I just want to remind you, they lost that fight Hunger Bowl. You remember who that was to? Uh, was that to the Illinois Fighting Illini? That was the Illinois Fighting Illini 2011 craft fight Hunger was, Bowl. So was that the Fighting Zookers? Um, yes, I, that was, yeah, because they just won back-to-back bowl games. They beat Baylor and RG3 in the Texas Bowl the year before, and then they went and beat UCLA in the Craft Fight Hunger Bowl. I think UCLA had to petition to get into that game because they were under 500. Uh, yeah, it looks like their final record was 6-8. and eight. That's kind of yeah. weird. Yep. Huh. Um, yeah, so to get back onto Chip Kelly and the defenses of the SEC... Uh, the stat that I meant to throw out there with Nick Saban. So his last four bowl games where he played an elite offense like Ohio State, Oklahoma, and Clemson, he allowed 40.5 points against him, him. So those teams scored 40.5 points against him, and he was 1-3 in, in those bowl games with the only win coming from that Clemson two years ago. So everybody's saying, oh, Chip Kelly's not going to be a good fit because the defenses are too much. But I think a lot of times the defenses benefit from the fact that there's really no offense played. And if the last four times Nick Saban's gone against a really elite def- or offense, he hasn't done so well. So I'm excited, man. But we can get off of that. I know not everybody wants to talk about Florida and Chip Kelly all the time. Um, I think right now I- I'm going to say I'm 90% certain that Chip Kelly is the new Florida coach. 90, wow. Leaves- which leaves um, Nebraska, Tennessee, um, who else is out there? UCLA. Most Scott Frost likely going to Arkansas. Nebraska, right? That's what Twitter says. That, that's what Twitter says for now, but obviously they haven't fired their coach yet. Nope. So I don't know how they can hire a guy before they haven't even fired their guy. So we'll see. More than likely that'll probably happen. I'm about 80% sure that'll happen. I don't think Tennessee is going to get John Gruden. I don't know who Tennessee goes after now that Chip Kelly and John Gruden are off the board. They're probably going to get some trendy coach from the Mac or something, or you know, the next guy, you know, the hot shot coach. But we'll see. I don't, I don't even know who know that is. That's Scott Frost this year, but I don't know who who. It's going to be some mid tier guy who comes up and gets uh, paid almost nothing. From what I've seen from Twitter the last week, their wish list from fans. I don't know if this has anything to do with who their administration is going after, but they want Patterson from uh, TCU. They want Dan Mullen from Mississippi state. Um, And obviously they wanted chip Kelly. See, those are lateral moves for all those coaches. I I don't know why they, I don't know. No, no. I think Tennessee's a step up for Dan Mullen out out of Mississippi state. Yeah. Maybe. I mean, Mississippi State, if you look at where the programs are trending right now, I mean, Mississippi State's going up for sure. And um, Tennessee, while they have probably more potential to go up, you know, with like the amount of money and facilities there. I don't know. I I think I might stay put if I was Mullen. The only thing I can see with Mullen is he would be out from playing. Well, no, he'd still have to play Nick Saban every year because that's their cross-division rivalry. Is Tennessee, Alabama, but he wouldn't have to worry about beating Nick Saban to win the the division. True. Um, and then maybe he could stick it to Florida every year. He can kind of see that as an opportunity to say, "Hey, you guys had three opportunities to hire me, and you never did. So here I am to be a thorn in your side." But to be honest, I don't know if he if this is another hiring cycle and he doesn't get out. Some people say it's because he's happy there, but I don't know who's happy. Being at a program where you're, no offense, Mississippi State, but you're sub 500 um, SEC play every year. I think this will be his second season or second or third season out of nine where he's going to be above 500 in the conference. Yeah, I'm not sure uh, how the program looks going forward, what their recruiting classes look like, but to start over at a program that is at rock bottom like Tennessee is – I don't know. It might be easier to to wait out for you know a better phone call down the line. Yeah, I, I definitely can't wait till all these dominoes fall and we can actually start talking about who their coaches are and what we think their outlook for is for the future. That's not one of my favorite parts of the year. It sounds bad because a lot of people lose jobs, but then I don't feel bad for those guys because then they get paid four to twelve million dollars. Like Jim Moore just got paid twelve million dollars to walk away. 
and now all of a sudden I don't feel so bad for Jim Moore anymore. Yeah, getting paid not so, to work has got to be a pretty sweet deal. I, I say this all, every time. If my job paid me $12 million to, to walk away, I would be skipping down the street oh. with my paycheck. Oh, for sure. Me and you, I would fly you to Orlando so we could party. I'd be there in a heartbeat. Yeah. We would be buy, we'd be like uh, Ric Flair at the at the bar buying 157 kamikazes. <laughs> yeah, there's really I, I wouldn't think of anything else I'd do with that money. So <laughs> there's really no All other right. way to spend it. I mean, it would be awesome. Well, let's get into the games from this week. Let's talk about things that have happened rather than things that are going to happen. Yeah, I guess if we have um, to talk about these these games, it was. I, okay, so let's start off. Do we start off with Michigan Wisconsin? Because I felt like that game was at the wrong time slot. I don't know what that game it was, was doing at noon. It's the only game where two ranked opponents were playing each other. And we're we're opening that up at noon. Yeah, that was uh, that was like the big tenniest game ever. Um, there were so <laughs> many runs and punts, and then a few fumbles mixed in. I think Hornibrook threw for like 140 yards in the win. He did have another pick. Um, Wisconsin had like a a punt return score that the punt like bounced like three times before he picked it up and then he returned it for a touchdown. It was, it was an ugly game. Um, It was kind of exactly how we thought it was going to be. Last week I called Michigan uh, Wisconsin light. They're, they're the same team as Wisconsin, just not quite as good at any aspect of it. Their quarterback plays even worse than Wisconsin's quarterback play. And the defense, while good, is not quite as good as Wisconsin's. So, um, I don't know. I keep saying that if Hornibrook keeps turning the ball over, they're not going to win. And he keeps turning it over, and they keep winning. So, it may be time, you know, on here November 19th, that I might <laughs> buy Wisconsin. Is And now, is that because you kind of have to buy Wisconsin because they're your only hope of getting Team Big Ten into the playoffs? I don't think they're the only hope of getting in the playoff. Um, I think Ohio State still can make it if they win out. Um, They have a lot of work that needs to be done. Well, it'll be if they win out and they beat Wisconsin, and hopefully Wisconsin wins uh, this week. um, But if they beat an undefeated Wisconsin team, they'll have a really good win on that resume. And like I said, the teams like Notre Dame's not getting in over Ohio State if Ohio State wins out. That's just not happening. Um like these other uh, two lost teams, like you had, you know, OK State was going to be in contention at two loss, and then they went and blew it this week. So I think Ohio State, if they win out, um, I don't think both Miami and Clemson get in. So um, so what you need to have happen is you need Alabama to beat Auburn and Alabama correct. to beat Georgia. I mean, correct. that's where I say you kind of need some outside help because worst right. case scenario is Auburn beats Alabama close. Yep. And Auburn beats Georgia in a blowout, and the committee's kind of like, well, we still think Alabama's one of the best teams in the nation, and we can't put them in without putting an Auburn team who just blew out a top 10 team and beat um, Alabama and beat Georgia two weeks ago. So that would be the worst, the, that would be the one way that the Big 12, or sorry, the Big 10 doesn't send a two loss team in. Right, so I don't think that's too much to ask for. Ohio State winning out and Bama winning out. I mean, that's how it really should happen. It looks like, but that's how it should shake out. Yeah. Yeah, but we'll we'll see. Um, this is going to be typical Wisconsin. They're going to go into this Big Ten championship game undefeated, and they're going to lose by like forty, and it'll finally silence everyone who's been saying they should be in the top four. But we'll see. You know, I wouldn't mind seeing them go undefeated. Like I said, every week, not a Wisconsin hater. Um, just don't think they're the best team in the conference. So something I wanted to talk to you about is Michigan. It's year three. Um, one more game in year three of the hardball era is wrapped up. Are you yeah. surprised that this is where Michigan is at the end of year three? If I told you three years ago when they announced the hire of Jim Harbaugh that this is what they would look like, would you argue with me or would you say, yeah, I can see that? I would have argued with you. I am surprised. Um Harbaugh in his career, and I don't have the number right in front of me, but he is really bad against ranked teams, and he's awful. He might be winless against the top 10. Um, 
and everyone talks about how great of a coach he is and how great of a motivator. And I get that. He, he does seem to be a great motivator and uh, he gets the best out of a lot of these kids. But if you're not going to beat the top teams in your conference, I mean, there was some stat earlier that uh, Mark D'Antonio up at uh, Michigan State in a three week span this season had beat more top 10 teams than Jim Harbaugh had in his career. So I don't know. At some point, you got to start winning the big games. And like you said, this is the end of year three. He's got his guys in there now, his recruiting classes. It's time to start winning games. I don't care how many kickers' houses you sleep over at and get all these big-time recruits. It's time to see some some results on the field. They need to start contending for Big Ten championships next year. Yeah, um, with with Michigan, I, I'm not going to say, hey, it's time to jump off the Harbaugh ship. I think he's the coach that you want to be in this situation. You kind of have to have faith in him that he's going to turn around because he has been a proven winner in the past, not just in college, but in the NFL. I, I think Michigan has to hold on a little bit longer. I see Michigan fans on Twitter all the time. Some of them are already jumping ship. Some of them are, you know, bemoaning their season. And they only have three losses. So it's not like you, they're 6-6 six and six at the end of the year. They most likely will be 8-4 and four, um, at the end of the regular season, which is not a bad a bad season I tell Michigan fans all the time that I see complaining about their season I'm like look I will trade Florida season with your season (laughs) any day if you want to have Florida problems come talk to me they just need to get a quarterback they just that's all they need Um, I was listening to the Wisconsin Michigan game at work on the radio or on tune in and I was listening to the Michigan broadcast when O'Korn came in to replace Peters Mm -hmm. it was like it was like the air was sucked out of the room for that broadcast booth they tried so hard to to not talk down the kid, but you could just hear it in their voice, like how bad a corn has been for them. And it seems like that's the missing piece for this Michigan team. And I, I don't think it should be missed that Michigan lost a lot of players to the NFL last year. And you can't just wave a magic wand sometimes, unless you're Nick Saban, apparently, or, you know, Dabo Sweeney, who apparently can lose people all the time in, to the NFL and still go to the playoffs every year. But... You can't just yep. replace that many players and expect you to come back uh, bigger, better than ever when you've only had three years of a recruiting base to have. Nick Saban and Dabo Sweeney have both been at their schools for over a decade or right out a decade. So they have the recruiting base to take those those losses where Jim Harbaugh hasn't had that yet. Yeah, and Harbaugh's got a lot to build on. That defense is still elite, and they did send a lot of players and a lot on the defensive side uh, to the NFL and they're still, like, one of the top ten defenses in the country. Uh, like you said, it all boils down to quarterback. Uh, they need to get their guy in there. Um, they've had a lot of running back injuries. I think they're on their third or fourth string running back during that Wisconsin game. So, um, luckily, he's got that defense to build on. What they are at, though, is the, kind of that uh, Jim Harbaugh tipping point where he doesn't necessarily last more than, like, four or five years at most places. Um he, he's a tough guy to work with by all accounts uh, from everything you hear about him. And he kind of runs himself out of town after four or five years. So they're at the end of year three right now. And if they don't start winning before, you know, everyone up at Ann Arbor gets sick of him, you know, you could run into kind of an ugly situation there. So I, I hope they're better. I hope they're contending for big 10 championships in, uh, in the near future, hopefully as soon as next year. But I mean, that's what they expect definitely... and they demand up there. So. He definitely needs to turn it around next season, uh, more so against Michigan State and Ohio State. I even think – I'm pretty sure they play Notre Dame next year. So he cannot leave his fourth season having only won one game against the rivals. Um, right. I'm pretty sure he's 1-4 or 1-3 and three right now against Michigan State and Ohio State. You can't add Notre Dame to that list of losses to in rivalry games. But I – if 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 Michigan fans need hope, I think Jim Harbaugh is the right guy for them to put their hope in that he's the guy that can turn it around. Yeah, and we say turn it around, and they have you know three losses, so it's not much of a turnaround. Right. Um, yeah, right. right. I, so I, I think they want to see. I think the biggest complaint for Michigan fans is they're not blowing out everybody, and they're not beating their rival. Um, they're not going into Ohio State this weekend with any confidence. Um, that they'll beat Ohio State. At least no fan that doesn't think with their heart. They think with their head. Obviously, you're always going to have those fans that say, oh, I believe in Michigan no matter what. We're going to beat Ohio State. 
Um, I I'd love to see them beat Ohio State. To be honest, I think again, I'm a I'm a big fan of chaos. Don't you I'm put that evil on me. We need upset. the Big Ten. <laughs> Come you on, man! Ride that. or die with Wisconsin, bro. Ride or die with Wisconsin. You gotta give my you gotta give yourself options. So I need Ohio State to to win this game, go into the Big Ten championship with only two losses because the Big Ten championship's losses. already set. So um, we can't have either one of those teams lose. It hurts the other one if the other. T- so if Wisconsin loses, that hurts Ohio State winning out because they're like, oh, you know, yeah. Wisconsin, you know, has a loss. It's especially, not as good as win. Especially so. with the committee being so low on Wisconsin as it is as an undefeated team. Yeah. So I need the Ohio State to win this uh, rivalry game this week. Need Wisconsin to win theirs. But. So yeah. this weekend wasn't so bad as the schedule uh, suggested. Notre Dame versus Navy was actually a really um, good game. It wasn't good enough for me to watch the whole way through, but it was good enough for me to flip back and forth. Obviously, I was watching the Gators finally win against a team. But they didn't have football that. two years ago. Um, yeah, seriously. Yeah. But a win is a win is a win. So Notre Dame over Navy, did you watch any of that game? Yeah, I watched uh, – I, like you, I had it on jump. Uh, it was real sloppy conditions, um, which kind which of benefits a team for like Navy. Navy. Yeah, that doesn't throw the ball very much. So uh, that worked well for them. Um, Winbush had multiple turnovers again for uh, Notre Dame. Um, I don't know. Notre Dame, you know, they're not really, you know, they're going to like the Fiesta Bowl or something. So good luck, have fun. But like to me, their season doesn't matter anymore. Now that they're out of the playoff picture, there's really no way they can work their way back in. So struggling with Navy certainly doesn't help your case. No, not at all. And Navy almost won that game. The final drive, it was like fourth and ten or fourth and five. I don't know what it was. But they ran. They had the perfect play call. They ran a pitch to the running back, and then the running back pulled up, and he had a receiver or a tight end wide open. But the running back threw a lame duck in the air. Um, when you're a team that your quarterback isn't even that good, probably shouldn't have your running back throwing the football either. Yeah, and just kind of lame ducked up there. If if the guy could have actually just heaved the ball up as hard and far as he could, the the receiver would have like caught a punt. it. Yeah, yeah, the 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 receiver would have caught it and just waltzed into the end zone because he was behind the defense of Notre Dame. That I almost shouted like, "Oh my God, Navy's gonna win!" And then I watched him throw it, and it kind of just lame ducked on him. And I was like, "Oh man, they just lost it." But kudos to Notre Dame, I guess, getting the win. And kudos yeah. to NBC for getting Mike Tarico. I love listening to that guy call the game. Yeah, he, he's a good listen. Uh, he definitely makes uh, Notre Dame football a little more palatable for me. Um, yeah. <laughs> like, it goes from, like, Especially making me want to, like, losing. throw up in my lap to, like, yeah. maybe I'll have him on jump. Uh, but, yeah, Tarico, he's got and, it good. That, um, there were some other good games, though. Did you uh, – Miami – beat Virginia, and they were down 14 early in this game. It was 14-0 right out of the gates. Miami was a little – I think they were a little still hung over from their Notre Dame party. I think they, they – could be. The noon game didn't help out at all. They probably went out still partying Friday night, woke up early, realized they had a football game at noon, and, like, the alarm probably went off at 1130 for most players, and they're like, oh, shit, I got to go down to the stadium and play Virginia. It yeah, was 28-14 no, to 14 in the third quarter. Yeah, Miami was down early. Uh, that turnover chain uh, was uh, firmly on the sideline. Um, I'm not sure that the academics are totally fixed there in Miami. I don't know if you saw it, but the wide receiver who uh, for Miami who caught a touchdown late, I think to put him ahead uh, for the first time, he shushed the crowd. And this game was in Miami, and he's shushing the home crowd after he scored a touchdown. I don't know what he was doing there. Um, that's usually a move reserved for a, a road game. But uh, he shushed the home crowd down there in South Florida. So, Yeah, and then Miami rattled off 30 unanswered points out of nowhere. It was very fast how they kind of came back. And if you looked at the scoreboard, you would think, wow, Miami handled Virginia. No big deal. But that was not the case at all. Yeah, they struggled most of that game. So, um, you know, good to see them get the win. Um, they should keep their spot in the playoff uh and it's making for a really great ACC championship game. It really should. I'm, I'm actually kind of getting excited for that one. Clemson has South Carolina, obviously. I'm not sure who Miami's last game is. I'd have to check the schedule, or maybe you put it down in our notes here. But 
Let's move on to one of the upsets that did happen. A ranked team did fall, hurting the yes. the Big 12's chances of now basically Oklahoma's it. Oklahoma's their last hope. Kansas State upsets Oklahoma State. And Kansas State went up big. Oklahoma State started to come back. Um, they were within five points, but couldn't get the job, couldn't finish the job. Yeah, it was a furious comeback by uh, Mason Rudolph and uh, that whole Oklahoma State team. Like you said, this game, uh, it was 42-13 at one point. So, um, you know, props to them for the comeback, but too little too late. And like you said, now they're out of the um, the playoff picture. They're out of the Big 12 uh, hunt. It's going to be Oklahoma and TCU in the Big 12 championship. And we had talked about this game prior to getting on the show, and you had said that this was not really an upset. Um, Kansas State is a really good team. And they have been kind of hanging around. Their record doesn't really speak to how good they really are. Yeah, um, Vanderbilt was a bad loss for them, but they've played everyone tough. They played Texas to a double overtime game. They played Oklahoma that game they should have won. Uh, they beat Texas Tech. They played West Virginia close. So they've been in every game this year. Um, yeah, I think the only surprising thing about this game is that they scored so many points. Well, not really surprising, but I guess that's kind of one of the things that Kansas State can kind of do. Whatever you're good at, they can hang around with you. So if it's a defensive game you want, they'll give you that game. If it's a if it's a high scoring game like Oklahoma State likes to play, they'll hang around with you that way too. Yeah, K State they were playing to become bowl eligible, so um, they do have a little bit on the line right now. Um, but yeah, it's they're a tough team. Oklahoma State obviously was the favorite and should have won that game, but you know it's not the most surprising state win. So we did talk about uh, there were a few Oklahoma other... being. What's that? Yeah. I said there were a few no, other yeah, good so games. Yeah, we had uh, Illinois uh, cover versus Ohio State. I don't know <laughs> if you saw that, but the fourth string quarterback came in for Illinois, and uh, he ran for a late nine-yard touchdown on his first snap, and that covered the spread. Illinois covers the 41 points. I yeah, think that's I, all that I needs to be last, said about that. I tweeted at you last night that uh, if you voted on the college tailgaters' teams, or not voted, but if you bet on the college tailgaters' teams to cover their spreads, you would have won some money. Yeah, I sent it out early in the day um, that you'd take Illinois plus the 41 and the over, and you'd hit them both, and you did. I was glad uh, my team got represented, though, on uh, national TV. We all got to watch that game on ABC this week. Yeah, that was a good another good pick by the powers that be as to how they pick games, and congrats on that, But It didn't have to be a Friday night game for you guys to be on national television. Yeah, they're really only uh, – Two other games, though, worth watching this week, and that was uh, Cal Stanford, the big game, of course. Um, Stanford won that one, which uh, what that did was it eliminated Washington from the Pac-12 championships. So they will not be defending their Pac-12 championship this year. Uh, Stanford did not need the assistance of the marching band this time. Um, <laughs> they just got they beat Cal outright. So um, Bryce Love, though, is injured, and that's something to look uh, look at going forwards, especially if they're – it looks like it's going to be, what, Stanford, USC uh, meeting down the line here for the Pac-12 championship? Yeah, probably. And then USC won basically off of the – probably the coolest fake punt return. Is that what it's called? A fake yeah. punt return? Um, yeah. I'm surprised nobody's thought of this in the hundred-some-odd years that football has been being played that nobody thought to have one guy pretend like he's signaling for a fair catch while the other guy actually goes after the ball because the return people aren't looking for the ball. That's not their job. I mean, I guess they kind of know where the punter is going to punt it, I guess. But they basically saw the shiny uh, object and ran towards that. And it was kind of cool. Kudos to USC for running that play. But if it wasn't for that play, they would have lost the game. Well, the Chicago Bears have done that uh, in the past. They used to do that with Hester. After he returned a bunch for touchdowns, he'd go back there and pretend to catch it, and someone would catch it on the oh, opposite really? sideline. Oh, yeah. Uh, they did it famously against the Packers once, uh, I want to say in a playoff game, and they called a hold on a guy who was uh, not in the game, and no one could find oh, where so the hold why was. Didn't, that's why it yeah. didn't end up on Sports Center. Yeah. For people but, to notice it. Okay. Yeah, I, I only watched that USC UCLA game. I turned it on for like literally one second, and I saw Darnold throw a pick. Um, so that was, that was, you know expected and entertaining all at the same time but so yeah here's it, a game that was a okay yeah so here's a game that was a snooze fest but hey baker mayfield knows how to keep himself in the the storylines uh oklahoma obviously blew out kansas 41 to 3 now who are you blaming this on so obviously everybody knows baker mayfield grabbed his crotch 
after he threw a touchdown pass towards the Kansas uh, Kansas bench. But Kansas didn't shake his hands at the beginning of the game. So who's at fault here? I don't think anyone's at fault. I love this. Um, I think both sides are – I think both sides played it right. Um, Kansas, you know, they don't have anything to make headlines. So not shaking Baker Mayfield's hand puts them in, you know, the national media. Uh, they get their attention. So I like that from them. Baker Mayfield at that point is well within his right. Uh, you know, he is screaming F you across the field at him, grabbing his crotch, like he said. I love it. I think there needs to be a bad guy. Um, you know, he's almost like a WWF like villain and it's great. Uh, someone needs to be the bad guy. And I think he's the perfect fit. Definitely so has the talent to back it up. He's obviously everybody's number one. Heisman Trophy uh, winner right now, right? I, I don't yes. think I've heard anybody say otherwise um, who has a Heisman vote or who has a voice or a national radio show. So he's the number one Heisman Trophy winner. And I kind of pose the question to you. Obviously, I think he will win the Heisman. But when we got guys like Baker Mayfield, like Johnny Manziel, like Cam Newton, this kind of comes up. Should we get back to this aspect of the Heisman Trophy? So I'm, I'm on the Heisman Trophy site. It says that it is awarded annually to the most outstanding player in college football whose performance best exhibits the pursuit of excellence with integrity. That integrity clause is kind of gets debated. Should that integrity clause be a factor anymore? I know now we ignore it, but would you be mad if all the voters said, yeah, we didn't vote for Baker Mayfield because he's grabbing his crotch and he's planting flags. Or maybe two, three years ago, whenever it was. Oh, gosh, now it's probably five years ago, right, since Manziel won it? It feels like two years ago. Time goes by fast. Yeah. Would you be um, mad if they did that? If they went back to that value that's supposed to be part of the Heisman discussion? No, I, I, I wouldn't be mad necessarily if they did it. Um there's other awards in college football. There's uh, I forget what the best quarterback one is. There's the Doak Walker for running back. So there's different awards that are just for your on-field uh, accomplishments. I don't mind at all that these guys win. Like you said, the the Cam Newtons, the Jameis Winston, um, Johnny Manziel. I don't mind that they win, but I wouldn't hold it against them at all if they wanted to go back to this you know pursuit of excellence with integrity. Um, there's other awards you could win, but. You know, if this was like a Hall of Fame or something, I, I would say it doesn't matter at all. Like, it's not the Hall of Good Guys. But right. um, if if the Heisman, you know, the people who award this, if they wanted to get back to this, I would have, you know, I got no heartburn with that. Um, there, there's other awards to win. Now, now, granted, I think as far as quote-unquote bad guys go, uh, Baker Mayfield is at the bottom of that list. Um, he's definitely not. He's definitely not a Johnny Manziel. He's nowhere near being famous, OJ. famous, and some of those <laughs> no, nowhere near OJ allegedly. All all those things happened after he won the award. Um, I'm just saying, uh, OJ's Heisman hasn't been vacated, but since Reggie Bush's mom got a car and a house, nobody <laughs> won the O5 Heisman. Nobody won the O5 Heisman. It's it doesn't count. But the 68 Heisman still exists. That's OJ's. The 68 does exist. Again, he didn't do it during his college years, I guess, is what they're <laughs> going with. But, yeah, but, uh, I think Mayfield should win. Uh, I'd like to see him win. But, you know, it's really no skin off my back if they decide it's their award. If they decide not to give it to him, who cares? Right. And I think, again, I think uh, awarding it to these guys kind of does water that aspect of it down. I've, I kind of said in previous shows that, I feel like the Heisman Trophy just doesn't have that, that I don't know what the word is I'm looking for, but just that glory, that that recognition that it once had. Yeah, it'd be best for college football if they did give it to Mayfield. Uh, he's definitely the biggest talking point in all of college sports right now. So um, giving it to him would raise their profile. Would, I mean, people would watch that ceremony to see what he'd say on the stage. So I would personally give it to him. Um, I, I would hope will. he'd go up there and be like, ladies and gentlemen, the <laughs> Generation X proudly presents to you the Heisman Trophy winner. Cutting a promo up there, definitely. Yeah, yeah, He needs, like, a good nickname. Like, <laughs> I don't even know. We'll just give him the badass Billy Gunn. Yeah, that'll work. 
I mean, are you? But are you excited about the Heisman Trophy this year? Like, when was the last time you watched the ceremony? Uh, it's it's been so clear cut who's going to win for the last I don't even know how yeah. many years that I, I I can't remember honestly the last one I watched. Uh, it doesn't really do anything for me. Yeah, I think the last time that it was close, and maybe it's because I paid attention, was when Tim Tebow won it against um, Darren McFadden. There was a lot of people that thought Darren McFadden would have won. Yeah. A lot of people thought Darren McFadden deserved to win. It was a very interesting um, Heisman Trophy award. But after that, I feel like everybody kind of knew um, – what's his name? Your boy that played for Minnesota and the Rams – Bradford, Oklahoma Sam guy. Bradford. Bradford, Sam Bradford. Everybody kind of knew he was going to win it because he was putting up Xbox numbers. Everybody kind of just knew Ingram was going to win it, even though people talked about how Alabama doesn't get Heisman Trophy winners. So Yeah. I mean, RG3 had it before the year started, it seemed like, uh, in 2011. So none of these have yeah, been particularly close to me. I mean, you knew like the second game last year that Lamar Jackson was the Heisman winner, so... Yeah, once he routed Florida State, I think pretty much he was awarded it. Yeah. All right, yeah, so next I... week shapes up to be a lot better. It does. Rivalry week. So we went from Cupcake Saturday to Rivalry Week. And uh, some of these uh, it starts on Thursday. Are... Yeah, some of these rivalries are kind of cupcakes, though. Let's start off with the two cupcakes of Florida, Florida State. Yeah. Both got big wins. Florida State scored 77 points. Um... Flip a coin, man. I don't know who's going to win this game. It's in Gainesville, right? So um, yep. I would say that uh, the Gators come out on top of the uh, – what do they call it? Like the toilet bowl or something? Something like that, man. I, I really hope you're right. I, I lean towards Florida State just because they have a coach. They have a quarterback. It does help. Um, we have a lot of injuries. We're down to one guy that has a scholarship at quarterback. He got banged up in the last game, and we were looking at putting a wide receiver who hadn't played quarterback since high school to take over. So I, I will laugh my ass off if Florida wins because it's like one of those where your team is bad, but you beat your rival anyways. That I, Sometimes I feel like that's a better way to win than when yeah, your team is good. Yeah, this is the, this is the whole season good. for both these teams, right? Like everything comes down to this for these two teams. The whole season can be well, forgiven. Yeah, if Florida beats Florida State, it kind of makes – Florida State's rescheduling of UL Monroe moot. They rescheduled UL Monroe uh, the next week while everybody's playing conference championship games. Florida State's playing UL Monroe so they can get into a bowl game. That's how <laughs> pathetic Florida State is this year. So it'll be kind of funny to watch Florida beat them. And Keep then it's like, out. if you're if you're a Florida State player, do you even show up to that UL Monroe game? Like, why am I even here? I'm ready to start my winter break. Yeah, there's nothing like sticking it to your rival. And uh, Illinois has got a chance to do that for the Land of Lincoln Trophy this week down in Champaign when those nerds from Northwestern come to town. Oh, man. Is that what it's called, the Land of Lincoln? I like that name. Land of Lincoln Trophy. Um, yeah, Illinois has got trophies with a that, bunch of teams. You know, they had a trophy. I'll give that to the Big Ten, man. You guys have a ton of trophies. Yeah, there was like that turtle, the Illibuck, that Illinois and Ohio State play for, which – I hadn't seen, you know. I think Ohio State's probably had that since, like, the 60s. But uh, It's probably a doorstop on Urban Meyer's uh, office. Yeah, they got to go, like, find it before the Illinois game. Um, but, yeah, there, there's some good rivalries. We got the Egg Bowl on Thursday. Ole Miss down in uh, Stark Vegas, Mississippi State. Um, Mississippi State should go over pretty easy in that one, right? Like, Ole Miss is in a down year. Um, yeah, I mean, once your coach gets fired for uh, escort <laughs> services – Right yeah. in July, it's kind of hard to bounce back from. I'm honestly surprised uh, Old Miss did as good as they did this year. I was expecting them to kind of be like a bottom dweller, but I th I think they're bowl eligible if I'm not mistaken, or they're five and six. They're right there. Yeah, I think your boy Mullen secures his uh, over 500 record. Uh, Mississippi State should be able to take care of business that week. They should. Clemson, South Carolina, the Palmetto Bowl. Um, any game that has Will Muschamp playing against somebody that's decent at coaching. I'll take I'll take the decent coach any day. <laughs> it just so happens he plays Dabo Sweeney, who I think is fastly making his way as one of the top three coaches, if not top two, 
um, depending on how this season pans out for him. So yeah, he's got to be right there with Meyer, so. I think it'll be one of those games where, obviously, Will Muschamp's really good at coaching defense. So there'll be, like, early struggles, and then Clemson will pull away, probably like a 24-13 to 13 type game. I could see some along those lines. Uh, it seems like South Carolina has overachieved a little bit this year, so um, I'm hoping it's a good game, but – and it is at South Carolina. Um, but, yeah, I, I fully expect Clemson. Uh, Kelly Bryant's getting healthier and healthier. That defense is solid. Um, and I'll talk a little about their defense when I give out my game ball. But I, I think Clemson, you know, I, I have them as my lowest ranked of my four playoff teams right now. I actually had them out. But if you're going to put them in, they're at four for me. Um, but I think they should be able to win uh, setting up a really fun game with Miami. Yeah, that sounds good, man. Um, one game that we thought would have been fun, a game that we thought would have had playoff implications and Pac-12 implications, was the Apple Cup, Washington State and Washington. That game is back to being what it's been every single year for me, a, a game I don't care about. Yeah, so Sorry, uh, West Coast guys. I mean, you got nothing to apologize for. It's two two loss teams that have no playoff hope. You know, what's the point of watching that game, staying up late for it, you know? I don't know. We talked about it early. Like it was almost like a playoff elimination game early, and now it's it's nothing. Nobody cares. You're gonna if you're a Washington or Washington State fan, you're gonna remember it as another pretty good team you had that goes on to play in some relatively high profile game. I mean, it's probably the game that decides who goes to the Emerald Bowl and who goes to the Sun Bowl. Like right. Which which uh, Pac-12 associated bowl game do these teams get to go to, uh, depending on who wins and loses? Yeah, it's, it's got to be disappointing for both fan bases. Um, but yeah, there's uh, there's some other ones out here. USF, Southern Florida, they can go play spoiler this week. Oh man, UCF. the Warren I-4 War comes to Orlando. Four. Yeah, Warren I-4. This was a um, Warren I-4, so Interstate 4 connects Tampa to Orlando. This was actually the name of a rivalry back in the 90s when it was the Tampa Bay Storm versus the Orlando Predators arena football type deal. So we've kind of, obviously arena football, I don't think it exists anymore. At least it doesn't in Orlando anyways. They've kind of stolen it, adopted it as their own. This is a game to decide who goes to the AAC championship. UCF is obviously trying to keep their undefeated season alive. Um, I'm kind of excited for this game. I'm, I'm excited to see how Orlando turns out. Hopefully they fill up that stadium and wins one for Orlando, man. Yeah, it'd be awesome to see UCF continue that undefeated season. USF's got a pretty high-powered offense. Quinton Flowers is a legit dual-threat quarterback. So it should be a fun game. I'm hoping for um, – you know, I've driven on I-4 a fair amount of times, and that thing is – it's a nightmare. It is a war. So I'm hoping this is just as bloody, just as awful as I-4. <laughs> you know, a, a total full-on fight, you know. Yeah, 3.30 Black can, Friday, man. Yeah. 3.30 uh, Black Friday. I look forward to it. Um, another interstate rivalry is Georgia Tech, Georgia. I'm, yeah. I'm a big time Georgia hater, so let's go Georgia Tech. Go Hornets or Yellow Jackets. Yellow Jackets. Yeah, Yellow Jackets. Yeah. <laughs> so it's uh, got my wrong stinging insect. How dare you? Yeah, this one's uh, in Atlanta at Georgia Tech. What do they call it? It's the clean old fashioned hate. So um, is that what this game's called? Yeah, I Wikipedia what all these are called. Um, oh, okay. So. Yeah, clean, old-fashioned hate. Georgia Tech, we've talked a lot about them this year. They're another team like Navy, another one of those option teams where it's really hard to blow them out because they have uh, such good ball control. They keep it tight. This could go, you know, Georgia obviously has the better team and should win the game, but Georgia Tech could keep it close, and if it gets to, like, a one-possession game late, who knows? Anything could happen. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm definitely rooting for the Georgia Tech upset. Get Georgia out of there. I don't want Georgia to have any sniff at a playoff. So I can continue on saying that they haven't won a national championship since 1982, whatever it is. Um, so I'm hoping for that. Also, I'm hoping in the Iron Bowl for an Auburn win. No. Nope. Again, I love chaos. I love the chaos. And I'm hoping it happens. Yeah, um, that one's at Jordan Hare. So... Um, Alabama's going to have to deal with that. Um, 
We'll see. Both teams coming out of tune-up games. What Bama played Mercer and Auburn played, you know, who gives a shit? Um, UL Monroe. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, so we'll, we'll see. Uh, I think Jalen Hurts, again, is going to be the key to this game. And uh, I think his running ability is really going to hurt Auburn. And I hope, I, I hope, I hope, I hope Alabama wins this game and keeps the hope alive for the Big Ten. I see you're picking Alabama. I'm taking Alabama on the road. I'm going to take Auburn at home. War Eagle, baby. Ah. Get that upset. Nothing makes me happier than seeing chaos in the SEC. I love I, I love that it would be a different story. Nobody would have picked Auburn, Georgia to play each other in the SEC championship. Maybe people had Georgia going, but I don't think anybody had Auburn going, especially three months ago, or two months ago when they lost to LSU. Auburn was all but dead and done. So go Auburn. I'm going to make them my pick. All right, it'd be a great story, but the tide is going to roll again. All right, now we got Notre Dame and Stanford. I feel like we should have led with that before the Auburn game. Yeah, um, again, Notre Dame not playing for much. Uh, a win against Stanford would help them, I guess, if, like, I don't know, like a bunch of teams' buses crashed or something. They couldn't show up to, like, the playoff or something. But... Stanford, you know, Bryce Love, he uh, he left their last game with an ankle injury. So if he's not fully healthy, this is game Notre Dame could win, even though it's out in uh, Palo Alto playing for the Legends Trophy. Yeah, and I think this is a chance. Um, obviously, we said that Baker Mayfield has it wrapped up. This is a good chance for Bryce Love to pick up some Heisman steam if he can. If Baker Mayfield can kind of slow down while he speeds up, Maybe it's a chance for him to catch up uh, in the Heisman votes. I think it might be few weeks between this game and the Pac-12 championship game. Might be too little, too late, unless Baker Mayfield goes out and does uh, what Nathan Peterman did today and goes out and throws uh, five picks and a half or something. But I think that there's too much ground to make up. But it should be a good game. Notre Dame and Stanford are pretty similar teams. Um, they rely on good running games and a tough defense. But I don't know. Not a whole lot at stake there. So, yeah, kind of depressed, man. This is our last week of regular season football, and we roll into the bowl or the conference, conference championship, championship week, though. Game. That's that's going to be a fun, interesting, a lot of a lot at stake in those games. So, I'm looking forward to those. Now that now that we're doing a college uh, podcast, I guess we have to pay attention to these Christmas bowl games. Yeah, there's. So a, I'm kind of excited to see those and see the Belk like, Bowl and five. 5,000 people show up to the uh, shoelaces.com bowl, whatever weird name they have out there that threw out some cash to get their sponsorship in. Yeah, well, it's it's always a great turnout when you grab a team from, like, Idaho and one from, you know, Northern California and you have a meet in Fort Myers or something. Um, but, yeah, bowl season's always a lot of fun. Yeah, I like the, just giving people an excuse to go vacation down in Florida, man. Hey, I went I went down to the Texas Bowl down there in Houston to watch uh, RG three lose to my Illini. So nice. so some people do it. All right, man. Anybody? Any other games you want to talk about, or are you ready to wrap up the show with some game balls? Yeah, I mean that's about it for the rivalries. I'm ready to give out a game ball. You got one this week? I do, I do. Um, I'm gonna go with my boy Bill Snyder. Nice. This is uh this is one of the most interesting coaches out there he's he's kind of that old guard from the 80s and the 70s where he's stuck to one school and he's been at that school uh his entire career and the other part that makes his career interesting is so he coached from 89 to 2005 um he kind of retired i guess they went four and seven and then five and six i don't know if he was forced out or if he just kind of said it's time to go so he went Flash forward to four years later, I don't pay much attention to Kansas State, but he shows back up in 2009 and kind of just picked up where he left off. The guy's record is 208 and 110. And if you ask nine out of 10 college, casual college football fans, they have no idea who this guy is, but he's just kind of been that consistent uh, winner for Kansas State. And I would, I would have loved to have seen what he could have done at 
a, a much better college football program that puts more money, that's in a better recruiting location because he has a ton of 11-win season and 10-win seasons um, out there. Yeah, it's uh, it's really impressive when you see a coach with that type of longevity at a school. Um, and, you know, clean by all accounts. No recruiting violations or anything uh, right. big against him, you know, which is great. Uh, 1989, so Bill Snyder has been the coach of Kansas State for my entire life. Uh, yeah, other other than those four years. Yeah, he, the four I years he, he took retired. off. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what the deal wild. was, but Yeah. So, I mean, I'm looking at his record, man. He's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine seasons out of however many where he has 10 or more wins. That's, you're not going to find many coaches that have that kind of consistency. And at a, at a school like Kansas State, if you want to look at what it's like to recruit in Kansas, just look at the Jayhawks <laughs> and look at how much of a bottom dweller they are in the same exact state. And this guy has done it, man. Um, so he gets my game ball for upsetting uh, Mike Gundy going to another bowl game. I think this is his 19th bowl game he's going to. So kudos to you, bud. I like it. He's definitely, you know, a Hall of Fame coach. And like you said, recruiting there. I've been to Manhattan, Kansas, and it sucks. And to be able to get kids to go there to play for a legendary coach like him, that's pretty awesome. My game right, ball this got? week, I got Raleigh Webb, wide receiver for the Citadel. And the Citadel, <laughs> All right. they played Clemson this week. So they got to cash their check. I don't know how much Clemson paid them to come kick the shit out of them. But Clemson won that game 61-3. to And the Citadel completed one pass in the entire game. So a game that they are losing by more than 50, they completed one total pass. And that went to my guy, Raleigh Webb. And he made the most of it. That was a 61-yard reception on their only completed pass of the game. So my game ball goes to <laughs> Raleigh Webb torching the Clemson defense for one catch and 61 yards. You know what's great about that too, man, is – so Citadel I think is a military school. Yeah. So I don't know if they have to go into the military afterwards. I don't know what their commitment is because I think it's a private school. I don't know that it's actually associated with the military. Anyways, but if he does, wherever he goes in life, he's going to tell that story. People oh, are going to be like, yeah. oh, did you see – did you see Clemson won the national title? He'd be like, let me tell you, uh, Jim, over in accounting, I, I got actually behind have that a... defense. <laughs> that is awesome, man. That's a, that's a good game ball. I like that. Yeah, they completed All one right, pass, so there you go. All right, let me do one more check at Twitter. Let me see if Chip Kelly has been officially <laughs> announced. You're going to drive yourself uh, nuts, man. I, I, dude, <laughs> I have hit search Chip Kelly's name on Twitter like a thousand times this last week. This thing needs to happen. Um, let's see. Calhoun staff confirms Chip Kelly has signed with Florida. So I don't know who are you, Calhoun are you breaking is. News? But this is SEC Mike tweeted 13 minutes ago. I don't know who Calhoun is, but Calhoun staff confirms Chip Kelly has signed with Florida. Well, if Calhoun um, says so. I don't, I, I'm trying to look here. No, nothing. Nothing else other than that. I mean, I, I got a lot of breakings and people people on regular Twitter saying that it's happened. Um, I yeah. feel like I'd get so, like a, a legit notification if it actually happened. All I know is if Calhoun says it's true, it's true, damn it. I'm going to take it. All right, well, you SEC guys heard it Mike. here first on College Tailgaters. Chip Kelly to Florida. Chip Kelly. Well, I mean, they'll probably listen to this tomorrow after ESPN and everybody's breaking it. <laughs> yeah, a whole right, lot of man. Florida players have been sending out uh, thinking emojis, too. Like, every single Florida player in the last two hours has sent out that uh, fingers-on-chin thinking emoji. So What about the one with the cryptic. two eyes? Oh, no, none of that. One guy sent a shrug and a bunch of dots. So, yeah, man, I, I think... Uh, now I got a UCLA meets Chip Kelly tomorrow per at or, or at football scoop. Stop it! This is awesome, man. I hope I hope I hope tomorrow morning he's my coach. I, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to sleep tonight if he's not by by the time I go to bed. But it's it's been fun thinking about it. Glad this season's over for my Florida Gators. Put the dying dog down. Hopefully we can get a win against Florida State. Uh, 
anything else you want to, any other parting thoughts? No, that's it for me. Uh, yeah. Don't go too crazy on that Twitter there. All right. I'll try not to, man. Go Gators. Go Alina. Chip Kelly, if you're listening, buddy, welcome <laughs> home to Gator Nation. See ya. Later.